I'm having a bad week. I'm having a really bad week, and I'm feeling a little bit down. Uh, the first bad thing that happened to me is at the beginning of the week, a whole bunch of students at, um, at Perimeter came running over to me, and they said, we just read in a blog and on the, in the newspaper that one of your students, ex-students, has been arrested for running an internet um, prostitution ring. And I said, oh my god. It turned out it was true. The next day, immediately afterward, they brought me the Scientific American, and there's a great big page that begins with, a page with a great big picture of me, the bad boy of physics. I was like, oh my God, what did they find out? Well, I called up uh, the editor, I did call up the editor, and I asked him, why do you call me the bad boy of physics? Of course, I knew that it had nothing to do with the previous uh, bad thing that happened. But he said, well, it seems every five years, you seem to say something totally outrageous, which nevertheless winds up being true. Um, you seem to be a kind of bad boy. I asked him, did it occur to you that maybe I was thinking about these things for five years in between? He said, oh, no, I didn't think of that. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is one of those things. But there's a quote that I like. There's a quote that I like uh, very much. It comes from a famous intellectual by the name of Sherlock Holmes. And it says, when you have eliminated all that is impossible, which, by the way, sometimes takes five years, when you have eliminated all that is impossible, whatever remains must be the truth, no matter how improbable. The thing I'm going to tell you tonight is one of those things which seems nutty, it seems wildly improbable, but it wasn't just something that some of us, I wasn't alone in saying this, that some of us just said, oh, one day, oh, you know, maybe the world is a hologram. That's not the way it happened. The way it happened was exactly this way. When you eliminate everything that's impossible, whatever is left over must be the truth. So let me tell you a little bit about where we're going. Good. OK. What is this thing which uh, Sherlock Holmes might have eventually concluded after trying everything else? And the answer is that in a certain sense, in a certain peculiar sense, the world is a hologram. Now, not everybody knows what a hologram is here. You know, you've all seen these pictures which look three-dimensional. They're made out of a film, which is a flat piece of film. Nevertheless, they look fully three-dimensional. I'll tell you eventually what a hologram is. But the idea that the world is a hologram is a wild idea, or at least a seemingly wild idea. It all began with thinking about black holes. Black holes are those objects, the most, in some sense, the most exotic objects in the universe. They're dense, they're heavy, they're dangerous. But they're also ubiquitous. The universe is filled with them. And not only that, almost all of the information, now we'll come to what information means, but almost all of the bits of information in the universe, by a vast majority, exist in black holes. So in a certain sense, although they may be very, very exotic, they're almost everything, at least almost all of the information in the universe. So I should begin by telling you or giving you a picture of what a black hole is. Now, I assume that I'm not talking to physicists. For those people who are physicists, you know what a black hole is. But uh, for those who are not, I'll try to give you a picture. And the picture is an analogy. All analogies are defective. And I get some very funny emails from people who uh, read my analogy somewhere and pulled out completely the wrong thing out of it. I hope you won't, but I can't protect myself against it. But let me uh, give you my picture, a very simple picture that I actually learned from a famous Canadian physicist uh, named Bill Unruh. But here's the picture of what a black hole is. Begin by imagining a shallow lake. It's an infinite lake. It goes on and on and on forever in two directions. But it's only about a foot or a foot and a half deep. It's not very deep. And fish live in it. Fish swim around. Now, these fish have a rule. Whether or not the rule is a law of nature or a legislated law that was legislated by the kingfish. That's not important. The law is the law, and the law says 
that they may not swim faster than the speed of sound. All right? That's the rule. Now, this lake happens to have a very dangerous place. Somewhere in the middle of the lake, there's a drain hole. And the drain hole drains out onto rocks below. These rocks are exceed exceedingly sharp, so dangerous that anything that comes in contact with them will be immediately annihilated. And this drain hole has the property, as all real drain holes would, as, as you get closer to it from far away, the water flows faster and faster. The flow of the water or the velocity of the water becomes faster as you approach the drain. The drain is sucking water out at a sufficiently rapid rate that there happens to be a distance represented by the red line here at which the inflowing water is moving with the speed of sound. And as you go in even closer than that, it's moving even faster. What happens to a fish? Let's call her Alice. Poor Alice has passed the point where the infalling water is falling faster or moving faster than the speed of sound. It's also moving faster than she's allowed to swim. She's stuck. Nothing bad happens to her when she crosses this place. She probably doesn't even know it. You know what it's like? It's like rowing down Niagara Falls and passing the point at which you can't row faster, but you don't realize it. Nothing bad happens to you yet. <laughs> Nothing bad happens to Alice when she crosses the point of no return. Let's call it the point of no return, but nevertheless, she's doomed. Her friend Bob is on the outside, and Bob is waiting to hear from Alice. Alice has been calling to him, maybe saying, help, help, help. But after she passes the point of no return, not only can't she swim out, but her sound waves that she tries to send the message with are also pulled in faster than the speed of sound. And so she becomes permanently disconnected from the outside. She cannot get a message out. She cannot swim out. And so as far as Bob is concerned, poor Alice has disappeared out of the world. Well, that's about what a black hole is. A black hole is a kind of inflow. It's a kind of place where space itself is falling in. At a certain distance out, it's falling in so fast that to get out beyond it, you would have to exceed the speed of light, the local speed of light, and if you pass that point of no return, again, nothing bad happens to you, but you're doomed. Okay, so I've put this in a couple of uh, notations here. Nothing special happens at the horizon, but Alice, nevertheless, is lost to the outside world. All of her bits and pieces, when I use the word bits, you might think about information bits, if you like, but all her bits and pieces are lost. And the horizon is a point of no return, but it itself is harmless. The place which is harmful at the center of the black hole, that's called the singularity, but we're not going to be even interested in the singularity. All right, now let's move on to another subject. Of course, we're not really moving on to another subject. We're going to examine a few related subjects and then put them together. Information. Now, Information, whatever it is, we'll talk a little bit about what information means, but information comes in bits, in discrete units. Let me give you an example of some information. A sentence. King Canute had warts on his chin. I don't know if King Canute had warts on his chin or not. It doesn't matter. This sentence here expresses a certain amount of information. But when information Physicists, physicists, information theorists, when they talk about information, they're really not even talking about the meaning of the information. The meaning doesn't count. What counts is the symbols. This is a, this is a sentence, or, a bit of, or not a bit of information, but a collection of information which consists of the sequence of letters. Whether or not you can read English and decipher it is not the important thing. The important thing is it takes a certain number of letters to describe it. You could convert the message to Morse code. Morse code is, of course, dot, dot, dash, dot, dot. And in converting, this happens to be a, if you leave out uh, the symbols that you need to put the, uh, the spaces between the words, this sentence here is a 65-bit message in Morse code. 
And the real information is in this sequence of pluses and minuses or dots and dashes. This process of going to Morse code has replaced the sentence by a collection of bits. A bit is a dot or a dash. That's what it stands for. It's the same concept as in your computer, except in computers we talk about bytes. Byte is eight bits. Megabyte is eight million bits. So this is the same concept that you use when you ask how much storage space you have in your computer. Now let's go to the minus first law of physics. Why is it the minus first law of physics? Well, the first law of physics, there are at least two first laws of physics already. One of them is in thermodynamics, the other is Newton's. So I didn't want to call this the first law of uh, physics. It's more important and deeper than either of those two first laws of physics. There's also, because people realized there was a deeper law, they defined the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So the zeroth law was also used up. But there's an even more fundamental law. So what could we call it? The minus first law of physics, I will call it. Now, of course, it may turn out that Dick will discover the minus second law of physics and uh, so forth. But at the moment, this is the deepest law of physics I know. And it's that bits of information are indestructible. The meaning of that is that distinctions between situations, distinctions between configurations are never erased. They never disappear from the world. Let me give you an example. Here's again the 65-bit message, but now it happens to be stored on my computer screen. Well, it doesn't matter whether it's on the computer screen. It's buried somewhere in the computer memory, and it consists of a bunch of on and off switches, and it's a 65-bit message. Can you erase some of the message? Can you get rid of a bit? Can you erase a bit? Well, of course you can. If you couldn't erase some of your computer, your computer would very quickly fill up and you wouldn't be able to put anything new in it. So you have to be able to erase information. But when you erase information, in fact, you're not really erasing it. You're ejecting it out of the computer by one means or another into the environment. The result is the environment may actually be part of the computer. It might be the plastic of the uh, computer case or so forth, or it might actually be the atmosphere. When you eject a bit in that way, the indestructible bit, which cannot be destroyed, when you eject a bit, it adds a little bit of energy to the environment and thereby heats the environment. That is why your computer has to be cooled. Your computer has to be cooled because whenever you want to erase information, the bits are little bits of not only, as a matter of fact, they're not only bits of information, they're also bits of energy, and therefore you have to cool your computer whenever you erase. But the lesson here is that bits are indestructible. Information is forever. Well, now we have a very funny little paradox. On the one hand, the minus first law of physics says that bits are never erased. On the other hand, when Alice falls into the black hole and falls behind the horizon, as far as Bob is concerned, her bits have disappeared from the world. So in effect, for all practical purposes, for all physics purposes, Bob sees a world in which information is erased. Can this be right? This was Hawking's central point in 1976 when he created something that came to be known as the information paradox. It was an extremely deep observation. It was a very important observation. It is not important that Hawking didn't get the right answer. He asked the right question, and this became a central debate, a central question that took basically 20 or 25 years to resolve. We now know the answer, and we'll come to it. The answer is that bits of information never are lost, but Nevertheless, the things that came out of the question is so deep that one can hardly say that it was Hawking's mistake. It was one of the deep observations about physics that led to great things. Okay, so you might say, wait a minute, wait a second. The bits, Alice's bits, fell into the black hole, and there they are, they're in the black hole. Maybe you can't get access to them. It's not too different than locking them in a room and throwing away the key. We don't say that information is lost then. But to make things even more confusing, and this was another discovery of Hawking's, an earlier discovery of Hawking's, black holes evaporate. They disappear. 
It's as if the box that you hid some information in, after a while, disappears. How that evaporation takes place is not so important. Basically, anything evaporates. Everything evaporates. If you give enough time, little pieces of it break off and disappear into the atmosphere. And if I were to just draw or to uh, you know, use my extremely crude computer skills to try to make a movie of a black hole evaporating, what does it evaporate? It evaporates photons, light, gravitons, other kinds of particles. And as it evaporates, it loses energy. And in the process of losing energy, it shrinks. And it eventually shrinks down to a very tiny black hole. And then it's gone. But when it's gone, where is Alice? Or more to the point, where are Alice's bits? Where are the bits of information that the minus first law of physics says can never disappear? The black hole is gone. Alice's bits could not have gotten out from behind the horizon. Why not? Because to get out from behind the horizon, they would have had to exceed the speed of light, just like the fish would have to exceed the speed of sound. And so we have a real dilemma. We have a conflict of principle. On the one hand, black holes seem to erase information. On the other hand, the most basic law of physics that I know says that information is never erased. Next, what is entropy? You've all heard the word entropy, and you probably uh, have heard that entropy has to do with confusion, and entropy has to do with chaos and entropy has to do with the world coming to an end because everybody gets too confused to tie their shoelaces or whatever. But um, entropy has a very distinct meaning, so let me tell you what it is. Here I've imagined a bathtub full of water. Just uh, to get away from black holes for a while, let's think about a bathtub full of hot water or warm water. And how much information do we need to know about that bathtub full of hot water? How much information is there? And how much do we need to know in order to know whether we should step into it and take a bath? Well, really, there's about two things that we really want to know. We want to know whether there's, uh, there's any water in the bathtub. So we want to know the volume of water that's in the bathtub. That's important, how much water is there. And the other thing we want to know is the temperature of the water. Right? When you get in your bathtub, you want to know the temperature of the water. Okay? That's about all. That's about all the information you need. That's about all the information that would be easy to get. How much more information is there about that bathtub full of water? Well, the answer is a huge amount, an enormous amount of information. The physicists all know that. And what is it? Well, if you looked at the water through a microscope, you would, of course, see molecules. The position and velocity of every one of those molecules is information. That information may be extremely inaccessible. Let's call it hidden information. Why is it hidden? It's hidden because it's stored in a huge, huge number of degrees of freedom, many, many too many to, keep a, to, to take account of, and they're too tiny to see. That's all. So yes, the bathtub has a huge amount of hidden information, hidden, as I said, because it's stored in things which are too small and too, too numerous to keep track of. That's what entropy is. It is simply the information that's hidden, usually for the reason that I said. But for any reason, if information is hidden from you, we call it entropy. That's all that entropy is. What was extraordinary was that sometime around 1972, a young physicist by the name of Jacob Bekenstein, this is not a picture of Jacob Bekenstein in 1972, but Jacob Bekenstein was a student, and he announced black holes have entropy. What did that mean? That meant that black holes have in them hidden information. Well, that's not surprising. There's no surprise in that. Of course black holes have hidden information. The stuff that, that's exactly what black holes are. They're a place where information falls in and it gets hidden. You can't see it when it's behind the horizon of a black hole. But the real importance of what Bekenstein did was to be quantitative and say how much hidden information is in a black hole. What is the maximum amount of information that can be hidden inside them? No maximum number of bits that can be hidden behind the horizon of a black hole. 
Here is the way he approached it. I'm going to tell you, just rough it out for you, how he approached the problem. I'm not going to do the calculation for you. I'm going to show you what he did. He asked a question which is pretty similar to the following. Supposing you want to know how many atoms it takes to fill up a bathtub full of water. Well, there's a simple way to do it. You drop in one atom at a time, and you count how many it takes until the level of the water is up to where you want. You know what the answer is going to be. The number of atoms, or the number of bits, or the number of drops of water is going to be proportional to the volume of the uh, bathtub, right? If you double the volume of the bathtub, you'll have to put in twice as much water and therefore twice as many atoms. Right? So that's the kind of usual thing. What Bekenstein did is he said, let's actually count how many bits of information it takes to drop into a little tiny black hole in order to build it up to a large black hole. So he said, oh, let's start with a tiny black hole. Tiny black hole is practically no black hole at all. A tiny one, as big as a peanut. Well, a peanut is, in fact, actually a gigantically heavy black hole, about as heavy as the Earth. Let's start with a lighter one, as, about as heavy as a dust moat. And that's about the smallest black hole that you can have. And drop a bit of information into it. Now, what does a bit of information mean? A bit of information means an elementary particle. It could be a photon, let's say a photon, we drop one photon in, and the only information is that we drop the photon in. Or perhaps it's the information that we dropped a photon of one polarization instead of another polarization. But we drop an elementary particle. Now, there's a deep thing going on here that information in quantum mechanics comes in discrete units, and they're called particles. So what Bekenstein did is he said, throw in a particle, throw in a bit. The effect will be to increase the energy and therefore the mass of the black hole, and the black hole will grow a little bit. Do it again. Drop the second drop in. Black hole will grow a little more. Do it again. Do it again. Until the black hole achieves the size that you're interested in. And count how many photons of the appropriate wavelength does it take to build the black hole of an appropriate size? What did Bekenstein find? I wonder if there's another one after this. No. What he found, well, first, what was the natural expectation? The natural expectation would have been that just like the bathtub, just like the bathtub with a number of drops of water is proportional to the volume, the natural expectation would be that the number of bits of information that it takes to build a black hole of a certain size would be proportional to the number of cubic meters or number of cubic kilometers or whatever it is, the volume. That is not what Bekenstein found. What Bekenstein found was that the number of hidden bits of information in the black hole is equal to the area of the horizon measured in a unit called the Planck unit. First of all, that was very surprising, that it was area and not volume. What it meant was that when the bits of information fall onto the horizon, they behave as if they were little impenetrable objects which collected on the horizon and simply couldn't push each other out of the way and achieved some density, almost as though you had a bunch of coins on the table and you tried to pack them in as tightly as possible but on the horizon and not in the interior of the black hole. So that was the first surprising thing. The other surprising thing, well, it wasn't surprising at that, time, at that point, but it might surprise you, that the size of one of these little bits, in other words, the area occupied by one of these little bits, is very, very small. One Planck area. Planck does not mean a board. It's the name of the famous physicist Planck, who has a constant named after him called H. G here is Newton's gravitational constant, and C is the speed of light. And if you work it out, it's 10 to the minus 66 square centimeters. It would take about a thousand trillion, 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 trillion of these little Planck areas to wrap a proton, to wrap the surface of a proton. So this is a very, very small unit. But nevertheless, it's a discrete little unit 
And this is what Bekenstein calculated from the combination of quantum mechanics and properties of black holes. This was interesting. Now, what are, you could ask about a bathtub full of water. If a bathtub full of water has a, an entropy, it means it has hidden information. What is that hidden information? Well, we know now, today. It was not known, incidentally, around 1900. It was not known for certain that it was atoms, the motion of atoms and the positions of atoms which made up the entropy of a bathtub full of water. In fact, it was Einstein who nailed that concept in place, ultimately. But you could ask the same question about the black hole. If the black hole has entropy, it means there are hidden, tiny, microscopic degrees of freedom on the horizon, which we don't know about, which are somehow making up that, uh, that entropy. We're sort of in the same situation as just before Einstein, when it was known that fluids and gases and materials had entropy, but it wasn't known for sure what the degrees of freedom, the little objects which constituted the hidden information. We're kind of in that situation. There are examples, theories, mathematical constructions. One of them is in string theory, and I'll just tell you very, very briefly what, according to string theory, the entropy of a uh, Schwarzschild black hole is. I forget Schwarzschild, what a black hole is. String theory is a theory where elementary particles are little tiny pieces of string, little loops of string. A single elementary particle is the smallest possible loop of string, and it looks about like that, except a zillion times smaller. Now, you can take that little bit of string and you can heat it up. You can, how do you, how do you put more energy into it? You could put it into a frying pan and let it hop around, but that won't work very well. You collide other particles with it. You collide other particles with it. You smash it together with other particles, and the result is to add energy to it, and adding energy to it makes it vibrate, and makes it get spread all over the place, just like a wildly excited rubber band oscillating all over the place. It gets tangled and it gets bigger. So you shake them one way or another and you increase their energy and you increase their size. You add even more energy and they get more complicated. Eventually, if you add enough energy, and remember that energy is mass, if you add enough energy, you'll get a great big huge tangle of string does this tangle of string have entropy? Of course it does. If you don't, if you're not smart enough or small enough or capable of following every little turn of the string, and you simply say that's hidden from you because it's too small and too numerous, you would say this complicated ball of string has entropy. It's a string tangle. Now this is not yet a black hole. On top of that, there's gravity. Gravity pulls it together. If you collect enough string with enough energy, eventually gravity will pull it together into a black hole. So what is left over after it forms a black hole? Something which looks metaphorically sort of like this. Little bits of string still hanging out of the horizon, and it's those little bits of string in string theory which constitute or comprise the degrees of freedom which carry the entropy. But I'm not here to sell you string theory. Whatever the entropy of black holes is, it's something that's very microscopic, too small to see, very numerous, very chaotic. And I also should add, in a constant state of agitated motion, in a constant state of agitated motion, because it's in a constant state of agitated motion, and because it has entropy, Motion and entropy mean heat. That means that the surface of the black hole is hot. It's a hot soup of bits, a hot two-dimensional soup of bits. That's a funny kind of soup, two-dimensional soup. But it's a hot bit soup. And you can ask then, how hot is it? If somebody were to go down near the horizon of the black hole and measure the temperature of the region near the black hole, you could do that. You take a long cable with a thermometer on the end, you lower it down, the thermometer is connected by electronics to whoever it is who's out here lowering it down, reads off the temperature. The answer is that the temperature near the horizon of the black hole, 
as close as you can get to the horizon of the black hole, is about a million, billion, 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 uh, how many did I say? A million, billion, billion, billion degrees. Is anybody going to ask me whether it's centigrade or Fahrenheit? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, you should probably add uh, 273 or something. <laughs> it's really hot down there. Oh boy, but now we have a problem. We have a conflict. I originally told you that the horizon of a black hole is a harmless point of no return. Remember Alice? Alice sailed through the horizon. Nothing happened to her. Yeah, exactly. Remember her, her, her Alice. One theory that we've postulated or that we've said or that we've described says that she sees nothing out of the ordinary at the horizon, perfectly safe crossing the horizon. It's true, she's doomed, she's going to hit the singularity, but nothing special at the point of no return. And she happily sails right through the point of no, uh, no return, cool as a cucumber. The other theory says quite the opposite. The other theory says she encounters and falls into a soup of super hot, a super hot soup of bits at the horizon. What happens when something falls into such a superheated region? It is evaporated, it is ionized, it is thermalized, it's turned into evaporation products, which in this case basically means photons or other elementary particles which are just radiated out. So, here's the other picture. Alice falls to the horizon. When she gets within this thin layer near the horizon, the temperature becomes so hot that she's evaporated and just radiated back out with the Hawking radiation, with the evaporation radiation. This is odd. This is certainly an odd situation. Uh, we have a conflict. We have a conflict of principles. Does Alice safely fall through the horizon? That's what one theory says. Or is she thermalized at the horizon and eventually radiated back out in the form of scrambled bits? Scrambled bits just means you know, all mixed up. What's the answer? The answer is that both are true. Now, how on earth can both be true? They say contradictory things, apparently. One says Alice uh, gets, let's be blunt, she gets killed at the horizon. The other says she safely passes through with no problem, whatever. Okay, so here's something that illustrates the paradox. Bob on the outside, watching the whole thing, who doesn't get to see Alice actually fall through the horizon. He sees radiation coming out. He sees evaporation products coming out. Those evaporation products, he says, well, they must be Alice's bits. Alice is being thermalized and radiated back out. Poor Alice. Alice sails through the horizon, and in her own frame of reference, in her own reckoning, she says, I'm fine. Nothing happened to me. But there's no obvious conflict, operational conflict. Why not? Because Alice, saying she's OK, cannot get the message out to Bob. Bob sees no contradiction. He never gets to find out that Alice is OK. Alice sees no contradiction. She just falls through the horizon and finds nothing dangerous. But still, this seems ridiculous that we could be that confused about whether Alice is thermalized and destroyed at the horizon or falls cleanly through it. OK, let's suppose, let's, uh, let's even push the experiment a little bit further. Let's suppose that just before Alice falls through the horizon, she's already encountered this very, very hot region. Remember, it's just above the horizon, the thermometer lowered down, very, very hot. She's in the soup, in the hot stuff, before she crosses the horizon. Before she crosses the horizon, Bob takes a look at her. Now, what does it mean to take a look at her? It means he shines photons on her, or he shines electromagnetic radiation on her, which bounces off into his eye. And he asks, is she getting thermalized or isn't she getting thermalized? It's a fascinating story, but I'll tell you what the upshot is. In order for Bob to actually see Alice, in order to make the determination of whether she's being thermalized or not, 
he has to hit her with short enough wavelength photons, enough of them that these photons will themselves thermalize her, roast her. So in the, this is the way quantum mechanics works. Quantum mechanics is always like this, that you try to show that something doesn't happen by doing an experiment, and the experiment itself makes it happen. Very frustrating. Bob comes to the conclusion that Alice was tried. Why? He sees all this radiation coming back out. One could say Bob did it to her. But the operational fact is that Bob discovers that Alice was roasted. So there is no contradiction, and yet somehow it's not uh, completely satisfying. Something's going on here. Something deep is going on here about information, about black holes. Well, it seems, and I think this is correct, that there are two distinct representations of the same reality, the same information. One of them, the three-dimensional reality of Alice falling through the black hole. She looks around, she sees herself, she's three-dimensional, nothing has happened to her. And the other, two-dimensional, the two-dimensionality being this thin surface of extremely hot fluid which absorbs Alice, thermalizes her, scrambles her, and radiates her back out. Now, can there be two distinct descriptions of the same thing, one three-dimensional and one two-dimensional? Well, sure there can be. A painting. A painting is a painting, a painting, a drawing, or a painting. A painting is a representation of a three-dimensional object. Let me just put up a painting for you. It's kind of a grim painting. Yeah, it's extremely three-dimensional. It's showing uh, all sorts of three-dimensional features, but really it's not giving three-dimensional information. It's a trick of the eye. Familiarity with the subject matter, familiarity with the way human beings look, familiarity with the way light scatters off things in your brain creates a three-dimensional fiction. What's really there is two-dimensional layer of paint. There's only two-dimensional information there. For example, can we tell whether the cadaver is a really short fellow, or is he foreshortened because he's sticking out, uh, out of the blackboard a little bit? You can't tell. There's no way to tell. You can't touch him. You can't feel him. You can't stick your head under him. You can't do anything to find out if he looks short because he's foreshortened or because he's short. Let's see. I, can you see what's behind this guy's head? There's a plaque behind his head. If it were a real three-dimensional figure, I could go over to here, around over here, and look at it. But I can't see anything. It just isn't there. The information, the three-dimensional information, is just not there. It's two-dimensional information, end of story. So let's talk about coding two-dimensional and three-dimensional information with bits. I could take that painting. Let's forget the fact that it has several different colors in it. You can always reduce the colors to, what is it, red, green, and blue? Uh, you can always reduce it to red, green, and blue and make a lot of little pointillist uh, pixels out of it and then represent the painting as a bunch of, well, it would take three, uh, three types of uh, pixels and not two types of pickle, pixels, but you could represent it as a series of pixels where the information would be coded discreetly in this case, in x's and zeros, x's and zeros. You could represent the two-dimensional painting that way. But supposing I wanted to represent a real three-dimensional reality, let's say this room. How might I represent what's going on in this room? I might divide the room not into pixels. You know what a three-dimensional version of a pixel is called? It's called a voxel. A voxel, V for volume. They're called voxels. You could divide the room up into tiny little voxels. Let's say each voxel was about as big as an atom. And let's simplify the story and say there's only one kind of atom. Everything's made out of hydrogen. Then I could completely describe what's going on in this room by saying yes or no in each pixel, in each voxel, whether there's an atom there or not. If I know where in every box whether there's an, a whether there's an atom there, then I know everything about the room, and I can represent it that way. So, in fact, I should be able to represent the world, or this room, or 
even way beyond this room, if I get into real microphysics, I might have to make my voxels smaller, but I should be able to represent that as a three-dimensional array of information. Can it be that somehow our world, or at least the surface of a black hole, can be described both in three-dimensional terms and two-dimensional terms? It seems impossible on the face of it. Three dimensions and two dimensions just seem very different. Can you take three-dimensional information and re-express it, voxels instead of pixels? Well, the answer is yes, but there's always a big cost. And the big cost is when you take the three-dimensional data and try to lay it out in two dimensions, the result is always to scramble it horribly. It's always going to be incredibly mixed up. An example is a hologram. A hologram is a piece of film. When I say the word hologram, I don't mean the image. I mean the piece of film that the hologram is stored on. This is about what a piece of holographic film would look like. Incredibly scrambled, lots of scratchy little things. If you looked at it through a microscope, you would see no pattern and you would not be able to tell in a million years what this thing was a hologram of. It's incredibly scrambled and it's two-dimensional. But if you know the rule, and in this case, the rule is an experimental rule, you shine light on the hologram and an image forms, a full three-dimensional image. You can find out whether this clown has hair on the back of his head. How do you do it? You go around to the back of the hologram and you take a look. Three-dimensional information. Of course, it doesn't contain the three-dimensional information of what's inside the clown's head, but if you made the hologram from an MRI scan, you could actually code the full three-dimensionality, including the brain and everything else, on the holographic surface here. So a hologram is a very good example Let's call it compressing data down to a two-dimensional surface, but in the process, scrambling it beyond recognition, unless you know the detailed code. Well, what's the upshot? The upshot is that a black hole horizon is like the scrambled hologram of everything that's inside, two versions of reality two reconstructions of the same reality. One construction or one reconstruction, the surface of the black hole, extremely scrambled, hot, hot bit soup, but containing exactly the same data as what fell in the full three-dimensionality of the things that fell into the black hole, which in fact were unharmed and unmutilated and just fell cleanly through the horizon. That is what we now believe, and there's an enormous amount of very, very sharp mathematical evidence for this picture. Uh, it's not something that was just made up for fun, no, the world is a hologram, or a black hole is a hologram. There is very sharp mathematics to it. I'm not going to do the sharp mathematics. So the picture is that the black hole, this is, this is not supposed to be the moon, incidentally. This is just a cutaway picture of the interior of the black hole. The surface of the black hole, which is what Bob sees, is this very scrambled representation of reality, of the reality of uh, Alice. And what Alice is more like is she's more like the image made up out of shining the light. Now, it doesn't have to do with shining of light. This is not, you don't reconstruct Alice by shining light on the black hole. It's a mathematical reconstruction. Two different mathematical representations of the same reality. This is the universe, or at least uh, this is somebody's representation of the universe. And what I'm going to tell you next is it's not just black holes, which are holograms, but in a certain sense, the entire universe can be represented as a hologram, or any finite region of the universe, any big chunk of the universe can be represented as a hologram in essentially exactly the same way. It does not have to be the stuff that fell into the horizon of a black hole. How did we come to this? I'm going to try to explain to you roughly how we came to this conclusion because it's very simple. It, it's very unintuitive. It's a crazy conclusion, but you can follow the logic of it. It's not that hard. 
take some region of space and put some stuff into it, some information. That information could be in the form of uh, letters of the alphabet, the alphabet soup, you know, the stuff, the real alphabets, genuine alphabet soup. It could be uh, wine, it could be cheese, it could be whatever you like. It's information, right? It tells you something about what's inside that region. The question first that I'm going to try to answer is, or answer in fact, is what is the maximum number of bits that you can squeeze into that region of space? That's a question. How many? Now, you would normally think that the maximum number that you can squeeze in should be proportional to the volume, right? Seems reasonable. But let's do the following thought experiment. Let's surround the region of interest, which has a boundary over here. Let's surround it with a shell of material. It could be a shell of steel. It could be a shell of photons. It could be a shell of anything that you like. And then squeeze down on it. Squeeze down on it in just such a way, give it exactly the right amount of mass so that by the time it, together with the stuff which is in here, by the time it is squeezed down to that surface over there, it forms a black hole. If, it has, if the shell has just the appropriate mass and you squeeze on it at just the point where it passes the surface of that region, it will collapse into a black hole. All right, now, let's assume that the minus first law of physics is correct. Information is never lost. Then the initial information content, the wine, the cheese, the alphabet soup, the information could not have been more than the amount hidden in the black hole. If it was more, that would mean that information was lost. But we know how much information is hidden in the black hole. It's the area of the horizon in Planck units. The conclusion is remarkable. The maximum amount of information that can be held in a region of space, this room, is proportional to the area of the walls of the room. It is this, as if the walls of the room were divided up into little tiny pixels, one Planck area on a side, and everything in the room could be described by knowing what was going on in those pixels. That's the, that's the argument. It's as simple as that. And the conclusion of it is that you can describe a region of space, any region of space, by data on the surface as if it were a hologram. The maximum amount of information in a region of space is proportional to the area of the region. region. I like to say that the world is a pixelated world and not a voxelated world. Let's move on. We have a few more minutes yet, I think. All right. Let's talk about cosmology. The reason I want to talk about cosmology is because there is another sense in which the world is a hologram, closely related sense, a very closely related sense. There are other kinds of horizons in the world besides black hole horizons. Let me explain to you the other kind of horizons that cosmologists, real cosmologists, not half cosmologists, are constantly concerned about and uh, tell you how they play into this story. Okay. Um, let me give you a model for the way the universe works. It's another fishy example, another fishy story. It's the way, it has to do with the way the universe expands. It has to do with the way the universe accelerates as it expands. Let's go back to the lake. Let's take away the drain hole. We're not interested in the black hole anymore. It's there, it may, there are black holes all over the place, but let's just take them away, they're not interesting, but there's something new. The lake is being fed from underneath by a uniform collection of pipes. And these pipes are bringing in, <laughs> I see Dick laughing, uh, are bringing in new water. What is, the, uh, what is the effect of this new water? The effect of this new water is to cause the puddle to, to you know, to, um, to expand, to, to grow, to stretch. Portions of it will separate from other portions. And the effect of it on these fish, incidentally, this is, Bob, uh, no, this is, yeah, this is Bob, this is Alice, 
And this is Charlie over here, but Charlie has nothing to do with anything. Right? <laughs> Charlie there. Right? And water is being pumped in, and as the water is being pumped in, the lake spreads. In fact, the way the lake spreads, if you work it out, is it spreads out according to a law that the further apart that you are, the faster you will be separating. This is called Hubble's Law, but this is a special case of Hubble's Law, which is called the Accelerated Expanding Universe. Now, Bob is sitting there, and he's communicating with Alice. But Alice is being dragged along by the flow, and so she's separating away from Bob. Eventually, a point will come where what happens? Where she passes a point of no return. The point of no return does not have to do now with inflowing fluid. It has to do with outflowing fluid from the point of view of Bob. At some point, the fluid is flowing outward relative to him faster than the speed of sound at some distance. And at that point, when Alice crosses that point, she can no longer communicate with Bob. She has passed through, let's call it an external horizon. It does not have to do with an inflow and a drain hole. It has to do with an outflow and expansion. Well, this is exactly the way the universe that we know works. It is expanding. It's expanding with the same pattern of acceleration as if it were being fed new space, as if space were constantly being replenished, therefore being pushed apart, and it has a horizon. Each person has their own private horizon, namely the region around them which is moving away from them with slower than the speed of light. That region they can see, what's beyond it they can't see. So it looks something like this. Here's Bob at the center, and at some distance out, there's a point of no return, and if Alice crosses that point of no return, she's, as far as Bob is concerned, out of this world, simply out of communication, never to communicate again. She's gone. There's a puzzling thing. It looks like there's a region of the world, maybe most of the world, which is out beyond all possible observation. What do we actually know about it? In fact, we know a good deal about it from observation. We know that the universe is at least a, th a thousand times larger in volume than the region that we can ever see. Ever see means within the horizon, within our horizon. The universe is at least a thousand times bigger in volume than the horizon region. So there's stuff out there that stuff is simply beyond observational science, period. Or maybe not. But, at least in a simple sense, in the same sense that you can't see what's behind the horizon of a black hole, that stuff is out beyond the ken of any, uh, of any known method of observation. What is the meaning? I mean, this raises deep, both philosophical questions, scientific questions, uh, puzzling questions that really do bother all people who think about this. What is the meaning of all the stuff out there, the scientific meaning of all the stuff out there, if it can never be detected? How can we ever hope to confirm it by real observation? What is the proper description of a world that is bigger than the cosmic horizon? These are all the same question, of course. But finally, is our cosmic horizon, the one surrounding us, is it a two-dimensional scrambled hologram of all that lies beyond it? These are questions which are deep, profound questions, and the only thing, I am not going to answer them, the only thing I can say now is we are all wrestling with them, and they're big questions, and they're hard questions. That's the physicist, incidentally. <laughs> That's the universe. So, I hope I've given you some flavor for the kinds of questions which um, we ask. But I, I want to convey something to you that it's, it's an extraordinarily remarkable fact. It's not a fact about me. It's a fact about 
the way human beings think, the way human beings, their cognitive abilities, that when you think about it for a moment, uh, you know, a small, relatively small band of hairless apes has been able to deduce all of this, has been able to deduce such strange and totally unintuitive, very, very foreign ideas, very, very abstract ideas about the universe as peculiar and as unintuitive as the world is a hologram. I thank you.